The world title is supposed to be the ultimate mark of prestige in wrestling, the symbol of excellence which tells the audience that whoever holds it is truly the best in the world. In practice, however, this has not always been the case. No, well, most of the all-time greats have had iconic runs with the top prize at some point or another. On occasion, we've seen far lesser quality title reigns. But which were the worst of them all? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Paper Champions, Wrestling's Worst World Champions. And if we're going to start anywhere today, we may as well do so with someone who was so undeserving of their time on top, they've since gone down in infamy as arguably the worst world champion of the century, and that's the Great Kali. Yes, Dalip Rana may be big, but that was about all he had going for him when he joined the WWE in 2006, as if we take his sheer size out of the equation, he was little more than a barely mobile man whose moveset was limited to a chop and a nerve grip. So it should go without saying then that watching his matches against the likes of The Undertaker and Rey Mysterio on SmackDown were like watching paint dry particularly slowly. That said, one person who was evidently a fan of the Indian native was Vince McMahon himself. Sure, this one should have been obvious as the boss has always had something of a fetish for big men above all else. But while with the likes of Giant Gonzalez and Mabel, he eventually realized it wasn't working, and so he started pushing them back down the card, with Kali, all he could see was money. And that was why, on the July 20th, 2007 episode of The Blue Brand, just one week after Edge had been forced to vacate the World Heavyweight title on account of injury, the big man went on to win a battle royal for the vacant strap. That's right, the great Kali of all people was now the holder of the big gold belt, the same belt which had been made famous by the nature boy Ric Flair. Unlike Flair though, the Indian's run following this would be memorable for all the wrong reasons, as he had arguably the worst world title reign ever seen from a full-time wrestler. Seriously, there wasn't a single highlight to be found here, just many, many lowlights. And of the lowest of these, none delved farther down into the depths of wrestle crap more than his now infamous Punjabi prison match against Batista at October 7th's No Mercy that same year. Why was this one so bad? Well, aside from the fact that it was the Great Kali in the main event, the nature of the bamboo made cage meant no one in the audience could see a thing that was happening in the ring. But then maybe this was a blessing in disguise in the end because, as we said, it was the great Kali in the main event. Still, for as bad as he was in the role, there are those who suggest there were worse world heavyweight champions out there than even him. And of the people who have been nominated for this dishonor, one of the most notable examples is Jack Swagger. Ah, Jack Swagger. On the face of things, he should have been everything Vince McMahon was looking for in a top guy. After all, he was big, athletic, all-American, and had shoot fighting skills. The only problem with this latter point, though, was that those shoot fighting skills didn't translate into a wrestling ring very well. And as if that wasn't bad enough, there was also the fact he had absolutely no personality at all. Yes, few people personified the late 2010's creator wrestler main event player in WWE better than the North Dakota native, as with his limited promo ability and blinding lack of charisma, it should have been clear to anyone paying attention that he was in no way ready for a run with the top prize. But Vince McMahon has always been one to dig his heels in, so regardless of whether or not Swagger had the right qualifications, once the boss decided to go all in on him by having him win the 2010 Money in the Bank ladder match, the writing was on the wall. And that would lead to the April 2nd edition of SmackDown that year, then as it was there, he cashed in on Chris Jericho to become the World Heavyweight Champion for the first and only time. Unfortunately though, this low light also served as the highlight of the entire endeavor as, after that, once the dust had settled and the fog of the moment had cleared, the company were left having to come to terms with the terrifying fact that Jack Swagger was now a world champion. And this meant he'd have to defend the title in high profile matches going forward, something he clearly wasn't equipped to do. So then it should go without saying that the 82 day run which followed was forgettable even as it was happening. In fact, the most memorable moment about it was that it mercifully ended when, during a Fatal 4-Way match at June 20th's Fatal 4-Way pay-per-view, the future Bellator star dropped the title to Rey Mysterio in a bout which also included The Big Show and CM Punk. 
And once that was done, everyone involved was able to pretend the whole thing had never happened, just the same way as people had tried to pretend another terrible world title reign never took place back in 1990. What was this one? Well, it was the time Sergeant Slaughter became the WWF champion. But wait, why was his reign on top here so notable? Well, outside of the fact that it was during the period where Sarge was also involved in one of the most tasteless angles in WWE history, it was also so short it didn't give him much time to do anything with it. Sure, you could argue that by modern standards a 60-day reign on top is respectable, but pre-Attitude Era, flipping the belt so readily just wasn't the done thing. No, this was the era of Hulk Hogan holding the strap for four years and barely even breaking a sweat in the process. So back in 1990, to go for less than three months on top was a sure sign that you were little more than a transitional champion, someone designed to get the belt from one babyface to another. And because this was Slaughter's only time on top of the mountain in New York then, it means he'll always be, to some extent, remembered as being just that a means of transitioning from the failed Ultimate Warrior experiment back into the safe hands of Hulkamania. Hell, if you're still not convinced of this, you only have to look to the fact he didn't get a single successful televised title defense during his entire reign. But even Sergeant Slaughter isn't the worst transitional champion in WWE history. No, how could that be when only a couple of decades prior to his time on top, Stan Stasiak was going a step further by having a run with the WWWF title, which lasted for only nine days. That's right, back in December of 1973, the journeyman performer got to have his moment in the sun, even if it was only a very brief moment. But how had this come about at all? Well, after Bruno Sammartino decided he needed to take some time off in 1971, the top prize of the company had been moved over to Pedro Morales instead. That said, while Morales was popular in his own right, he didn't have anything on the Italian strongman. And so that was why, a couple of years later, Vince McMahon Sr. was able to convince his top draw to return to the ring for a second run with the gold, one which he hoped would continue on indefinitely. Before he could get the belt back on Bruno, however, McMahon first had to find a heel to dethrone Morales, and that's what led to him booking Stan Stasiak to challenge the champ at a house show in Philadelphia on December 1st of 1973. Needless to say then, Stasiak would go on to win this one just as planned, but his happiness wouldn't last for long because on December 10th, just nine days later, he dropped the belt right back to San Martino with this making him the shortest reigning official WWWF champion of all time. Not that he's the shortest reigning world champion in New York overall, however. No, for the unlucky person this applies to, we have to travel forward to 1988, as it was then that Andre the Giant held the gold for a total of 1 minute and 48 seconds. And don't get us wrong here, we're not suggesting that by including Andre in this video it means he was somehow undeserving of winning the world title. No, of all the people of his era who never held the top prize in WWF, he was arguably the most deserving. That said, when it comes to the token reign he got, well, it's hard to look at this as anything less than a disaster because it didn't even last for long enough to boil a kettle. How did this all come about though? Well, back in February of the same year, Following the success of WrestleMania 3, Vince McMahon had made the decision to not only book the rematch of the century in Hogan vs. Andre, but also to give it away on free television. And this paid off for him big time in the end, because upon realizing what was going to be taking place at February 5th's The Main Event, a staggering 33 million people tuned in to watch the bout. But while most probably expected this to serve as another routine Hulkster defense, it never played out that way once the time came for the bell to ring. No, in a shocker, after using a combination of plastic surgery and Hebner twin magic, Ted DiBiase was able to make it so Andre came out on top. And why had he done this? Well, prior to the bout, the two heels had come to an arrangement where, once the giant won, he'd sell the title to the million dollar man for a very tidy price. Unfortunately for Andre though, this meant his run on top technically ended after less than two minutes. And given it would be the only time he ever won the world title in New York, it also means to this day he holds the honor of being the shortest reigning WWF champion of all time. That said, he's not the worst. No, far from it in fact, as can be seen in some of the names we've discussed already today. But what of the people who weren't even full-time wrestlers when they held the gold? 
Well, they're almost in a category of their own, and in that category, arguably, none are more notorious than David Arquette. Now, don't get us wrong, we like David Arquette. After all, he seems like a nice guy, and by all accounts, he's a genuine wrestling fan. But none of this changes the fact that he had no business winning the WCW World Championship in 2000, or at any other time for that matter. Truthfully though, he wasn't the one to blame for this. No, unsurprisingly, the whole thing came from the mind of Vince Russo. And why did Russo think it was a good idea to give the top prize in the sport to an actor who'd never wrestled a match in his life? Well, he had a movie to promote. That's right, back during the doldrums of World Championship Wrestling, an attempt had been made to boost the company's popularity by having many of their stars appear in the alleged comedy movie Ready to Rumble. But when poor reviews left interest for this one low, it was decided a last-minute Hail Mary attempt was needed in order to drum up some excitement. Now this Hail Mary could have been something as simple as bringing up the film on Nitro, or even having wrestlers such as Goldberg and Diamond Dallas Page talk about how much they enjoyed it. But that wasn't enough for Vince Russo. No, he needed to swerve everyone, bro. And so, on the April 12, 2000 episode of Thunder, he booked a tag team match pitting Eric Bischoff and Jeff Jarrett against David Arquette and then world champion DDP, with the stipulation here being that whoever scored the winning pinfall would become the world champ. Of course, Arquette ended up getting the fluke pin during this one, and so was crowned the de facto best wrestler in the world as a result. Yes, that's right, in the lineage of champions that includes George Hackenschmidt, Luthez, Harley Race, and Ric Flair, the Scream star was now forever right there amongst them. Were fans happy? No, but that didn't matter to Vince Russo because he was just pleased he got some mainstream press, even if that mainstream press was largely mocking in its nature. Still, you could argue that despite the backlash it received, Arquette wasn't the worst non-wrestler to hold a world title, no, for that, we'd have to go back over to WWF and take a look at Vince McMahon himself. Yeah, you heard us right. In the middle of 1999, right when the company was going through arguably its biggest wave of mainstream popularity ever, someone, and by someone we mean Vince Russo, decided it would be a good idea to have the boss win the world title. Was this a monumentally stupid decision, especially as it meant Triple H, the guy the company were trying to build as their next big star, would have to be dethroned unceremoniously? Of course it was. But when did silly little things like logic and quality ever apply to the self-proclaimed king of the swerves? No, all that mattered was popping those ratings, bro. And so... Feeling the ever-increasing need to outdo himself then, Russo gave us an all-time whopper on the September 16th episode of SmackDown that year when he had The Game, someone who had only just started his first reign on top a few weeks prior, be challenged by the man who was supposed to be gone from WWF forever by this point, Vince McMahon. Yes, it was a one-on-one -on -one match between a trained wrestler and a civilian businessman, so obviously, after Steve Austin got involved towards the end of the bout then, the civilian businessman picked up the win, and from there held the top prize in the company above his head in celebration. And what makes this one even worse is that Vince never actually put anyone over following his big moment. No, instead, on the next episode of Raw, he just came out to the ring with the belt over his shoulder and announced he was going to be vacating it, making everyone wonder what the point of the whole thing had been at all. That said, for as bad as the whole incident was, it still might not be quite as bad as our next subject, Harvey Whippleman. But wait, we hear you ask, when did Harvey Whippleman, noted manager during the Golden and New Generation eras, ever get to challenge for some gold? Well, as it happened, this wouldn't come until January 2000, long after he'd stopped being a regular on-screen character, as it was then he decided to take an unusual route towards success. What was this route? Well, it was basically to dress up in bad drag and interject himself into a Lumberjill Snow Bunny match for the women's title on an episode of Raw that month, and of course, this led to him ultimately winning the bout, and as a result, being crowned the new women's champion under the moniker of Irvina Whippleman. Yes, such was the state of women's wrestling in WWF during the Attitude Era that a half-forgotten manager from a decade prior could become the top star in the division, even if he was a man. And sure, he did lose it back to Jacqueline again just three days later, making him the shortest reigning holder of that particular belt. But the very fact Harvey Whippleman was allowed to hold the title at all was just a sign of how little respect the women in WWF were being given at the time. 
and it was also a sign of how little value the women's title had overall. But then given this was a belt which had already been held by the cat by then, perhaps its lack of importance in management's eyes should have come as little surprise. That's right, even during the darkest days of women's wrestling in WWE, few people were worse suited for a title reign than Stacey Carter. And that's because, unlike some of the other champions of the time such as Jacqueline and Ivory, she couldn't even wrestle a basic match. So when it came time for her to get her token run with the strap then, it would happen during a Four Corners evening gown pool bout where the cat would come out victorious. And now the champ going forward, Carter was forced to play her to her limitations by defending the title in a series of gimmick bouts which were seemingly designed by a teenage boy, including a chocolate pudding match and a Miss Royal Rumble swimsuit contest. Soon after though, Trish Stratus and Lita came in and managed to regain some sense of legitimacy for the division. As had the cat's reign gone on for much longer, the WWE Network would have had a lot more editing to do when it comes to their turn of the Millennium product. But let's move away from WWE for a while, because when it comes to our next subject of today, he was never really a player there. No, in the case of Ronnie Garvin, his big title win would actually happen under the NWA banner instead. That said, even in the NWA, it's not as if Garvin was someone considered to be world champion material by many. In fact, if anything, he was pretty much the personification of an upper mid-card babyface in Jim Crockett Promotions. So, from his perspective, it's just as well a stroke of good fortune came his way during the autumn of 1987. Good fortune which amounted to WWF choosing to directly compete with that year's Starcade by putting on their own pay-per-view named Survivor Series at the same time. And back in 1987, feeling the need to ensure they weren't overshadowed by this, JCP chose to have Ric Flair drop the NWA World's title during the lead-up to Starcade, so that he could then win it back again in a big climactic moment which would hopefully draw fans' attention. But before the nature boy could regain the belt, he'd first have to lose it. And this is where Ronnie Garvin comes into the picture as he just so happened to be the man Flair was feuding with at that point. So obviously it made sense for him to be the one to dethrone the champ on September 25th at an NWA Worldwide Wrestling Show in Detroit, Michigan then. Something he ultimately did, much to the shock of fans watching of course. That said, this shock wouldn't last for long because this one was always destined to be a short run, with the plan being for it to end 62 days later at Starcade. And once that night came and Garvin did indeed drop the title back to the Nature Boy, it was right back to the mid-card with him. Still, even if it was an overall failure of a run, at least it meant the Montreal native could always call himself a former world champion from that point onwards. Of course, one person who didn't need a bad title run in order to say this about himself, though, was our next subject of today. And that's because by the time Bret Hart won the WCW world title in 1999, he was already the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Sure, he'd achieved most of his success in WWF, the very place he'd become a five-time world champion and three-time WrestleMania main eventer. So there was an argument that if he really wanted to prove he was the best ever, he'd have to do the same thing in another company as well. Unfortunately though, by the time the hitman found himself working in Atlanta following the events of the Montreal Screwjob in 1997, it was clear he was a broken down shell of the figure he'd once been. Not physically. No, it was more of an emotional beatdown Brett had gone through after being screwed at the Survivor Series. And this meant, during his subsequent time with WCW, he mostly looked like he was sleepwalking his way through matches and angles, barely even caring about what was going on anymore. Of course, you could argue WCW also dropped the ball here by not giving the Canadian anything to sink his teeth into, at least not until November 21st, 1999 that was, at which point they finally realized they had a world champion level athlete on their payroll, so they gave him a run with the gold. But as we all know now, this run did little good in the end, because before it could even get going properly, Brett would have to vacate the belt. That's right, after a botched kick from Goldberg in December left him with a severe concussion, it was a continued downward spiral for the hitman, as by January of the following year, he'd have effectively announced his retirement from the ring. Could it have worked out better if Goldberg hadn't kicked him in the head? Probably, but we're still not entirely sure the title run would have meant much anyway. After all, this was a time when things were heading into WCW 2000 territory, a period where no one made it out alive. 
so maybe it's a blessing in disguise that Brett never had to face the wrath of this era as the champion, and that his failed run on top would be short. Sadly though, even if it was brief, it'll still go down in history as one of the worst title reigns to ever exist, as will all the other reigns we've discussed today.